A very happy Sabbath to you, and I want to thank, uh, I call him uh, Abba, uh, for reading our scriptures for us this morning. I want to start at the end of the scripture. If you have your Bibles, please turn in them. If you have your phone, uh, switch from Facebook uh, to your Bible app, please, please. Uh, Or you can text later, Uh, that's fine. I'm not one of those pastors who say, oh, electronics, I say electronics, yay, as long as it's the Bible that you're reading in church. Okay, so here we are. This is the last thing that was said. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. I want to say that humankind has been hiding behind fig leaves since then. I don't need to remind you of Zacchaeus, but I will. What kind of tree did he, did he hide in? If you read the New International Version, it will say the sycamore fig tree. Why would that have been helpful? except that it had big leaves to hide him. Why is it? Why is it that we have been hiding from God all these years? Why is it? Today and next week, I thought that we could have a little time together looking at trees. And the first tree to come to mind that was part of what was made on the third day of creation is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9 was found in the middle of the garden and it was told to Adam and Eve, don't touch, don't eat, don't even get close. There are various versions of why the opposite happened. One of those versions tells us that uh, Eve wandered off. I'm wondering whether this is the version that men wrote. Maybe it was that if you had to write it from a woman's perspective, it was that she was about her business and that she found herself separated from her husband, that is the truth. But I would like you to take note on the fact that right from the very beginning, because God made humanity to be a unit just like himself, when that unit got separated is when it was weakest. Take note of the fact that this was the moment that the devil took advantage of them. You know the great pom-poms in the air phrase, united we stand, divided we fall. Well, guess what? It's been true from the very beginning of time of humanity being here on this third rock from the sun. I want you to realize that trees symbolize not only kingdoms, but also people. As we look at tree number one today, I want to remind you of Daniel chapter four, in which we hear about Nebuchadnezzar. He is likened unto a great tree that the birds live in, that encompasses the the earth, and that everyone receives shade and fruit from. In other words, it is a kingdom that is supportive of humanity. We also can be reminded of the fact that that same tree stood on his balcony one day and said, all this I have made. And at that very moment, the prophecy came true. He lost his reasoning and he was sent out into the field to graze grass just like a cow. Not for a week, not for a month, but for seven years. Amazingly, in the story, he is given his kingdom back. And when his reason comes back and he is given his kingdom back, he becomes this 
this king that now knows that he has a kingdom only because God has given it to him. And he makes it a firm foundation of his kingdom that all should understand that the creator God is the one who is in charge. Our Sabbath school lesson this morning was about the three angels' messages. If you care to look at them today as your homework, if you haven't had a chance to read up on them, it's in Revelation 14, and it talks about the fact that there are three angels flying in the midst of heaven, and they have the everlasting gospel. Eric was quick to point out everlasting. Actually, I think it was someone else. This has been the good news, my friends, ever since we started hiding from God. The good news is that he is coming back, that he would like us to be part of his kingdom, the kingdom that is symbolized by a tree. Like to bring into your mind the idea of the fig tree and vine. In Micah chapter 4, verse 4, you have the second uh, tree that, that is talked about in specific. The tree and the vine, the fig tree and the vine are two uh, visuals that you can have in your mind that I know that when I taste the fruit from the fig tree, some of you say, Ugh, figs. No, don't ever want to eat figs, especially those dried ones. No, uh, figs are very sweet and delicious and, and very nutritious. Uh, that, that's my feeling. You, you can have your own feelings. I'm not going to judge you. Uh, but I'm sure that most of us like grapes. And if you think about it, these were some of the sweetest things that were known to the Israelite people. But this combination, if you look it up, if you look it up, every time it is mentioned, especially here in Micah chapter 4, especially the, the fact that this is meaning that there is going to be a wonderful sweetness that will exist in the people of God when they rest in His promise, when they realize that it is He who takes care of them. We also remember what happened in Mark chapter 11 when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and he met up with another fig tree. What did he do? The kids all know this story. Jesus is coming in, and what does he do? Parts those big leaves, right? And what is he looking for? He's looking for fruit, and there is none. And he puts a curse on that tree. And they go on into Jerusalem. When they come back out, the tree has withered. We've been hiding behind fig leaves for a very long time. In Mark chapter 8, verse 24, we read another story. Uh, I don't believe it's by mistake that Jesus healed this particular blind man. In Mark chapter 8, we, we see Jesus healing a man, and when he, he, he heals him the first time, what happens? His eyes are opened, right? And he sees perfectly. No. Very strangely, Jesus decides he's going to heal this guy in two stages. And in the first stage, when he touches his eyes and he says, what do you see? He says, sir, I see trees. So trees have been a big part of what God is trying to teach us about people. He sees trees, trees equal people. He touches his eyes again, and then they are opened, and the things that he thought were trees are people. And by the way, how does a guy guy that's been blind all his life know what a tree looks like? So was was he speaking prophetically when he said, I see trees? Maybe he's he's thinking this is what a tree must look like, but he saw trees walking around, and in actual fact, he was seeing people. I believe that we, uh, as as is pointed out here in Scripture, we are created to be like God. And so he 
puts a tree in the Garden of Eden to test our choice. The big thing that, that people want to talk about many times, and, and, and I, we, we don't have time today to really delve deeply into this, is that the fact that we have the power to choose separates us from the higher animals even. When Nebuchadnezzar decided that he was the one who had made all of his kingdom and he was not giving glory to God, God took away his power to choose and he was like every other animal in the field for seven years. This power to choose, this, this God-likeness is our defining characteristic, I believe, that makes us like God. So here as we look at this, this passage in In Genesis, we see that humankind made a choice. In our lesson study today, we see that there are choices that still need to be made, that in fact, the Adventist church has been called to preach a message to the world that says, you've got to choose who you're going to serve. It's our main message. We make good choices and we make bad choices. Those choices will end up being what we are judged on later on. Isn't that right? We said in our lesson study today that our choices come from what we really believe inside our hearts. And so if you go to Revelation 22, you will see that we will be judged on the doings of our lives, and we say, oh my, I thought I was, I was judged by righteousness by faith. Yes, we are judged by righteousness by faith, but when we have faith in Jesus, what we do shows that we have faith, yes? So you are judged on what you do because of what is in your heart. What is in your heart will come out in your actions, and the opposite The opposite will also be true. And the Bible says in Revelation 22 that he will give everyone a reward. Like I said, it's Christmas and everybody gets what they want. How's that? God is amazing in how he does this. Two stories I want to relate as we uh, think about this story, uh, this, this idea of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and making good choices. The first is in 1 Samuel 25. In this story, you have David, King David, is on the run from King Saul. While he's on the run with approximately 600 men, can you imagine? That's a pretty big group of guys to keep fed. They're trying to find a place to stay where Saul cannot find them. They do find a place out in the wilderness, and in that wilderness place there was a farmer, and he was farming sheep. In fact, David provided security. Now, I don't know if he had a deal with Nabal, but in the end, Nabal raises his crops, takes care of his sheep, feels like he's an extremely wealthy man, and as a result of his his wealth, uh, David is thinking, I I need to ask him whether or not he would help me with a little bit of food for my men uh, because of what we have done for him. Nabal turns his back on David. I, I I didn't ask you to do that. What is this? You're trying to rob me now. You, you, you're, you're a brigand. You're, you're on the run from King Saul. David, when he hears the news, which was brought to him by his servants, who had gone to talk to Nabal and ask him for a cut of what had happened there in, in his flocks and herds and his, in his grain that David had been protecting, he straps on his sword and he is on his way to kill Nabal. Now, listening from either another tent or close, close enough by is Nabal's wife. She is a beautiful woman. She is, she is the woman, obviously, of a very wealthy man, but she is also understanding that she is, is hearing from her husband's lips things that will destroy him. 
He is making choices that will destroy him and potentially their whole family. She knows David. She knows that he's got 600 men with him. What on earth is he going to do when this message gets back? He is going to come and ask for retribution out of Nabal. So very quietly and in some respects behind Nabal's back, ladies, take note, <coughs> she saddles up donkeys. She puts, she puts raisin cakes she puts bread, she puts grain, she puts meat on donkeys and takes it out towards where she knows that David is living. Good thing that she did this because on the way she meets David and his, you know, excisers who are coming to take what they thought was theirs and they were angry. She bows down low to the ground. She is very humble. She says, please, 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 my, my husband has, has said a very stupid thing. Great thing about this story is if you know the language, you know that Nabal's name means stupid. He makes this choice not to honor the hand of that has protected him. But she decides very wisely to honor the hand that has been protecting her. And she comes out and she feeds, she feeds David's men and they turn back. The end of the story is very interesting. We would probably interpret it as a stroke. Nabal's heart, the Bible says, turned to a rock. And he was motionless. We would look at those symptoms today and probably think he had a stroke and then he died. Interesting thing. David decided that Abigail was a very, very worthwhile woman. So he made her his wife. His second wife. Yes, there was polygamy in the Bible. And it wasn't like we do it today. What do we do today? Serial polygamy. Right? Okay, uh, another time. <laughs> Second story. Second story. There was a man, and he was, the Bible says in, in Luke chapter 10, that he was going from Jericho to Jerusalem. He was going along a very dangerous road. It was well known that this road had a lot of uh, brigands and, and robbers on it and that you had best go together as a group and have somebody who is going to protect you. Otherwise, you would probably get robbed, maybe even murdered, and this was well known. This gentleman encountered some thieves who not only took everything he had but also took his clothing, left him for dead after beating him senseless. Well, he wasn't dead. Along came the first passerby in the story. He was a Levite. Levites were the ones who did the various work that had to do with the temple. We might say today that they were the deacons of their day. He decided that according to the law, if he touched that dead body or got even near to that dead body over there because he thought he was dead, that he would become unclean. And therefore, he would not be able to do his church work. If I'm unclean, then I can't do my church work. Do you see his thinking? Would we blame him if we were the church people and think, oh no, we can't have a Levite that's touched a dead body because then he would be unclean. So the Bible says, Jesus telling the story, he went around and on his way on to Jerusalem, obviously going to do his church work at the temple. The next person to come along was a priest. You might think of this person as a pastor. He too has duties that require that he not get his hands dirty with things that would have, I don't know, the Yiddish word is chametz or, you know, oogies on them. Not supposed to. And if, if you don't believe me, read Leviticus. 
And you'll find that there are injunctions against certain things that you're not supposed to touch. And if you do touch them, you have to wash and you're unclean until sundown. So believe me, this is, this is not something that he was just making up. So he too decides he cannot get involved with this person. He doesn't even check his pulse to see whether he's alive or dead. He walks around him and goes on with his journey. The third one, you know the story, is uh, Jesus, by the way, he, when he tells stories, he loves to exaggerate. I, the, the, the English word is hyperbole. He tells big stories. So he's going to go for broke in his story, and so he chooses a person that he knows his audience really, really doesn't like. I mean, they hated the Romans, but they actually hated the Samaritans more because they were mixed. The Assyrians had come and had taken the Israelites away and they'd taken some Israelites to the other part of the Assyrian Empire and then they'd brought people from the other side of the Assyrian Empire and they'd settled them in Samaria and so the people of, of Israel had become mixed and so the Jews, Judah and Benjamin had decided those people there cannot be trusted to be safe people from our background and so therefore they stayed away from and stayed out of the circle of the Samaritans. So along comes a Samaritan, Jesus says, and he sees this guy, he gets off of his donkey, must have been a fairly wealthy guy, he had a ride. Yes, a donkey. The other two were walking, remember? He has a ride. So he's a wealthy businessman, he stops, gets out of his ride, gets off of his ride, and gets down to the level of the guy who's on the ground, checks his pulse, sees that he's bleeding, sees that he's being beaten, but realizes that he is alive. He takes what he has. He takes what he has and he heal, he, he does first aid as best he can, and we look at what he uses. He uses wine, he uses olive oil. These are great healing agents. He uses cloth to bind this guy up, and then he uses his own conveyance, let's use a big word, the donkey. He puts the man on his donkey and walks beside him to the next inn. And then goes what we would consider to be like the absolute extra, extra mile where he says to the innkeeper, here's some money, take care of this guy until he is well. Talk about great health care. You know, insurance. What, what if insurance was like this? <laughs> Here you go. Go down to Kaiser and stay there until you are well. Pete, can I get a, a witness on this one? Okay. And, and we'll pay the bill. More likely today, it's, uh, you've been here long enough, you need to go home now. I'm dealing with a parishioner right now. The family is having to pay because insurance has said, uh, her time is up. So now they're having to pay the bill to keep her where she needs to be until her bone heals. You know, doctors disagree sometimes. But in this case, it was just the, the businessman, and he had the money, and he pays, and he says, when I come back from doing my business, I will pay you whatever you need beyond what I'm giving you right now. What an incredibly generous, loving, kind act. And so it is that when Jesus asks his listeners, so who was the neighbor? Oh, can you imagine? They, they, they didn't even want to say the word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the one who helped him didn't even want to say Samaritan in these two stories we see one from the Old Testament one from the New Testament that there were choices that were made in the situation choices to serve Paul invites us in Galatians 2 verse 20 I know that that you knew this was coming, right? He invites us to be crucified with Christ. Did you know that Christ was crucified on a tree? We're talking about trees here, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about the fact that the Bible tells us that those who are put on a tree, those who are hung on a tree, are cursed by God. 
And here Paul has the audacity to say to us, you need to be crucified with Christ. My friends, the choice that we have to make today, the choice that was in the Garden of Eden, the choice that all humanity has had to make is, are you going to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Are you going to believe God or not? If you believe God, you're going to probably be like Abigail. If you believe God, you're probably going to be like the Samaritan, who is motivated and, and, and whose choices go along with their affiliation with God. Today, more than ever, my friends, I believe that, that if we do not have an, an, an action in our lives, if we do not have a, a, a walk, as you might want to say, in our lives, it really doesn't matter what our talk is. If our choices in, in this world show that we are more interested in doing things our way and then less interested in doing things God's way, then please uh, do yourself a favor and not call yourself a Christian. Because basically when we do that, and I guess we're all guilty of it, we give, we give Christ a bad name. That's why you hear me praying every Sabbath, God, please forgive us when we have not represented you as well as, as we might have in this last week. It is my prayer every day, every week, God, give me the power to represent you aright in the things that I do and that I say. May the choices that I make reveal the fact that no, I don't want to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If God said no, I mean, that means no, I don't need to do that. I need to listen to him. I need to make good choices and not be like Nabal the stupid or maybe like the priest and the Levite who hung on to human tradition so much that they weren't listening to the Spirit of God when it came to another human being. I would say today that in order to be crucified with Christ, there are two things that we have to choose. One is, we have to choose to be part of the kingdom of God. And the second is that we have to act in this life, not wait until the next life, but we have to act in this life like citizens of the kingdom of God. When Jesus asks us, who is your neighbor? Here in Santa Clarita, I certainly hope you can answer, well, I guess it was the guy that I helped the other day to change his tire. When, when you are asked to choose whom you will serve, will your actions speak as loudly as your words? That is my prayer for myself, and it is my prayer for you as my friends here today on this beautiful Sabbath. Amen.